to Van Hart. I don't know if we, we, we're going to have any <laughs> graphics of you dancing <laughs> in the <laughs> Halifax. <laughs> I want to get okay. back. I'm going to do that. Well, anyway, so change uh, gears a little bit. We're going to go into a bit more uh, uh, of the mechanics and the science behind the, uh, the middle ear uh, reconstruction. So, um, so I'm going to dive right into it because it's quite a long talk. Rather than shorten it, I'm just going to speak faster, and I feel sorry for a translator here. So let's just go back to the uh, fundamental problem. Uh, the fundamental problem is that there's an impedance mismatch of air with the inner ear. So we're trying to drive the impedance load of the cochlear fluids here uh, with the impedance of air. We just can't do it because it's just going to bounce off. So that energy, rather than be able to drive that, just bounces off the cochlear. That's the problem. So we have to try and overcome that impedance mismatch. That's the whole point of the middle ear. So, uh, so classically, when we try to drive a load with a small, uh, small uh, driving force, we can't do it because it bounces off. So rather than moving this load, the air just reflects off the uh, cochlea. So we want to try and make some kind of lever by changing the fulcrum uh, so that when we try and drive, uh, we try and, we try and uh, <coughs> drive this load, we, can, we give something else. We give up the distance, it moves to a smaller distance, but it's a higher force. That's classically uh, what the middle ear is, just a lever. So it's, a, it's an impedance matching lever. So in the middle ear, we mostly have the, the main, I know there's three mechanisms, etc. but the main mechanism is a hydraulic lever. So the main mechanism is the surface area ratio between the uh, tympanic membrane and the full plate. So you basically take this large surface area and you focus the pressure down to a smaller uh, surface area, so you end up with an increase in pressure but a decrease in volume velocity. So the volume velocity, large volume of air is moving, small force, high force, small volume velocity. So there's no gain in energy, it's a gain in pressure. So we talk about middle air gain, it's not an energy gain, because there's no active source of energy, it's a pressure gain. So it's about 17, 17 to 20, so we know a six, 20, uh, 20 dB is a 10 time increase, so a double of that is 26 dB increase, there's a 26 dB increase in middle air roughly. Uh, so, another thing we have to think about is that everything that vibrates, any flexible membrane that vibrates, like a skin of, an ear, uh, uh, of the tympanic membrane or, the, or a drum surface, has vibration modes. So, at some point, it breaks up in multimodal vibrations. So, the, this is a simple string, so at low frequencies, you can fit one wavelength in there. At high frequencies, it starts to break up into multimodal vibrations. That makes life complicated, because we're trying to drive that hydraulic lever will only work if the thing moves as a piston. But at high frequencies, the tympanic membrane doesn't move as a piston. It starts breaking up into little vibrating segments, as everything does that's flexible. So if you look at the eardrum, this is from Canada, at low frequencies, uh, and we've done this too, you can see that the eardrum moves more or less as a piston. But at high frequencies, you end up with multimodal vibration, and it's not really a very efficient piston anymore in the, for the hydraulic lever driving sense. So if you look at the pressure gain of the middle ear, the pressure transformer, this is a Kurokawa and Good study, classic said 1995. So basically, if you take the eardrum out and see how much pressure you need to drive the inner ear with the eardrum missing, at low frequencies, it's pretty efficient. It gives you about what you'd expect from a surface area, about 20, 25 dB gain. Uh, and so that's up to about 1,000 hertz. It actually is moving like a piston. You get the 26 dB gain that you would expect. At high frequencies, it becomes more and more inefficient. So there's not much pressure gain from the middle ear uh, at the higher frequencies. Uh, so a little bit of a background, just some basic uh, sort of physics type stuff. Uh, you all know this anyway, but you know, for uh, masses have inertia. So masses don't like to move back and forth very fast. So they, they, their reactance goes up with frequency. So as you increase the frequency, if you have a mass dominated system, the reactance or the amount of impedance that it exhibits goes up with the frequency. So if you double the frequency, you double the reactance. So you usually see a 6 dB per octave, because an octave is a doubling of frequency, 6 dB is a doubling uh, of reactance. And if it's stiffness dominated, stiffness doesn't like high frequencies, you usually see uh, the, the stiffness dominated systems, uh, the reactance goes down with frequency. So they, they are more, they have show more impedance at low frequencies. And at some point, you're going to find the, uh, every system's got some measures. Everything that vibrates has to have a reactance and a mass uh, to transfer energy back and forth, as it wouldn't vibrate. Uh, and uh, at some point, there's the uh, minimum, the impedance, where the reactance is minimum, is when you get the maximum uh, energy back and forth between the masses and the stiffness. And, and at that point, the impedance <laughs> is minimal. But as I say, 
you can tell the system is different <laughs> by the, if you see this kind of curve, 60 degree per octave, as you double the frequency, you know the stiffness dominated. And, uh, and you can also tell from the phase, which I won't go into. Anyway, uh, so if you look at the middle ear transfer function, this is the middle ear transfer function on several bones. It's from, uh, uh, from Zaski's group, actually, uh, Voss et al. Um, and you see in the low frequencies, there's almost completely stiffness dominated. That's 60 dBs per octave. So over under about a, uh, under about a, a th 1K, um, the reactance goes up with frequency doubling. It's almost completely stiffness dominated in the low frequencies, <laughs> below, below 1,000 hertz. So the middle ear is very stiffness dominated in the low frequencies, and it never really gets a truly uh, mass dominated part. There's uh, some mass dominance for sure here, uh, but uh, there's also delay, uh, which changes the phase. Anyway, there is some mass dominance, obviously, but in the low frequencies, almost completely stiffness dominated. So let's just back up a little bit, have a look at the middle ear. So we have a lot of losses in the middle ear. <laughs> the ideal system would give us that piston with the hydraulic lever, but we have a lot of losses because we have inefficient dri piston uh, driving at high frequencies. We have reactive components in the ligaments. We have slippages at these interfaces, so you lose energy across, you lose, uh, yeah, energy across there. Uh, there's loading from other elements like scarring and uh, air, etc. cetera. Uh, there's inefficient piston moment here, so you can start rocking instead of going in and out. So there's lots of places where you actually lose um, energy at the high, particularly at high frequencies when this thing starts doing all kinds of complex multimodal vibrations. And uh, if you look at the actual pressure, tr if you look at the uh, middle ear, at the pressure in the vestibule that you generate for any given pressure in the ear canal, so we said it was pretty good uh, in the lower frequencies, but you lose a lot across the vestibular ligament, across the stapes. So if you measure the pressure at in the vestibule, actually, in fact, there's only a slight more like that. <laughs> It's actually not a great middle ear gain, only about 20 dBs and in a range of frequencies from about 500 to about 2 3 K, is it any good? Uh, and we talked about the middle ear itself is pretty good, so we lose some in the low frequencies and there's to be a foot plate here. So this is fundamentally a different mechanism. At low frequencies, the middle ear, everything in phase, a different amount, but everything moves together like a couple of acoustic impedance lever. At high frequencies, it's all vibrating and fibrillating in different ways, so it's not really very efficient in the high frequencies. And there's a fundamental difference. That's why we see very difficult understanding high frequency movement. We have very difficult, uh, very difficult difficulty getting high frequency results too. So, for normal hearing, the eardrum is the motor of the middle ear. So you can't really get impedance matching without an eardrum. So, if you want to get uh, ear bone closure, you have to have a vibrating eardrum. So you know, there's no other way to do it. So. Uh, so the, the eardrum is the motor of the middle ear. So there's lots of things that can go wrong. So to get an eardrum, you need a pressure differential. Oh, it doesn't show up on there. On my computer, there's, a, there's an eardrum. <laughs> I don't know why it's not projecting. You can just about see it there. So you need a pressure differential. So if you have a hole in it, and on my computer, there's a hole there now, but then you don't generate pressure differential. So you lose a pressure differential. So perforation means the eardrum doesn't vibrate. If, you, uh, if it's... Uh, you need, I if it thickens up, I'm sorry, it's not projecting. It is on this one, I guess, over here. If it thickens up, you can see, then it won't vibrate. So uh, if it gets fixed at the edges, it doesn't vibrate. Uh, if, uh, if you get fluid in the middle ear, it doesn't vibrate. So many, many, many things can go wrong with the, uh, with the driver for the middle ear, so you don't actually get a chance to even get started with the impedance matching. This is what you're trying to achieve and you can't even get started unless you get a vibrating eardrum. So to me, the most important parameter if you're gonna get a good sickle pass result is, uh, is do you have ventilation? If you have a middle ear that's ventilated with an eardrum, you can start. Without that, you have a lot to do before you even get started. So anyway, uh, is this gonna do it again where it starts going forward by itself? Okay, so you need, uh, uh, you need needs an eardrum uh, to do that. Um, then the second thing is, this is the if you unwrap the cochlea, this is the oval window, the round window, vasal membranes between those two, you need to generate a pressure differential across those. Otherwise, there's not going to be any movement of basal membrane. So you preferentially want to direct the sound to the oval window and cover the round window to generate a pressure differential. So if this is the external, now it's doing it again. If this is the external ear canal pressure, 
<coughs> what the middle ear does, it really amplifies it at the oval window, it doesn't amplify it, it increases the pressure at the oval window, and it drops a little bit at the round window. Not much, because the, there's only about a 10 dB uh, shading from the, from the eardrum at the round window, but it increases this by about 20 dBs, right? So there's a big pressure differential uh, due to middle ear. So this gets shielded a little bit, this gets amplified quite a bit. So the difference driving them is quite substantial. Uh, so the other thing that people talk about is, uh, you know, the people talk about phase protection around window. That's all really crap because if you look at the, this is the, this is the wavelength of a typical sound, like a one kilohertz sound, so 15 centimeters. The, the uh, round window and open window are only separated by two, three millimeters. So there's no, they experience basically the same pressure. So uh, they're, not much, they're not much separate, much smaller than, than one wavelength. So really, basically, they experience similar pressures. So it doesn't matter where your perforation is, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to direct pressure at one window more than the other. So um, this, is what this, so this is basically a kind of schematic of what's going on. This is the pressure at the ear canal. This is the pressure at the oval window. It's amplified by 20 dBs. Uh, and then this is the pressure at the round window. It's dropped by about uh, 5, 10 dBs. Uh, and this is the difference driving the inner ear. So it doesn't matter if they're in phase or out of phase, uh, the, whether, whether you add the amount of pressure to this or subtract it doesn't make a big difference. What's really driving the ear is the pressure gain at the oval window. It doesn't matter if you shield this or not, because that's going to make that difference. Uh, whether the, the, whether the round one is here or here, shielded or not, makes no difference, because it's this gain at the, at the oval window that's driving the inner ear. So it doesn't matter if you shield the round window very much. Uh, and we've done these experiments. We actually shield the round window um, with silastic and with clay and stuff. It made no difference in a normal ear because it's been driven totally by the gain at the oval window. So round window shielding the normal ear makes no difference, really. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, so if you don't have a middle ear though, then things start to become more difficult because now you still want to, so if you're missing the middle ear ossicles, you still can drive the inner ear fluids a little bit but they're driven by the pressure in the ear canal, and there's a little bit of shielding here compared to here. So the difference between the amount of pressure hitting these two is not very much. It's about one thousandth of the pressure of the ear canal. The difference is about a thousandth of the pressure of the ear canal, so minus 60 dBs. So, um, <coughs> so, uh, so with acoustic coupling, uh, basically the ear canal pressure is driving this, the round window is being applied almost the same to both windows, but there's about a uh, minus 40 dB difference. So it's about a, a minus 40 dB, not minus 60 dB. So that's about a, a hundredth of the pressure. So in this case, if you can shield the round window, then you get a much bigger differential. So with acoustic coupling, round window shielding becomes much more important. So, so this is the pressure that would be there, uh, minus 40 dB of the pressure of here, which is a hundredth of this pressure, the difference. If you can shield that a little bit with acoustic coupling, now it becomes actually important. So, but you also need air here, otherwise the round window can't move. So this is a carbon minor of a type four, but you need air here, otherwise the round window membrane can't move. So, uh, so if you look at the intact here, this is the pressure in the ear canal. We go up by 20 dB in the, in the, at the oval window. We drop, uh, we drop by about uh, um, you know, 5, 10 dB around with us. This is what drives the inner ear normally. If you take this away, the pressure difference between the around and the one is only minus 40 dBs compared to the external ear canal, about a hundredth of it. This is acoustic coupling. So you've lost about 60 dBs here of sound pressure difference. So with a, with a complete loss of middle ear, we end up with a 60 dB conductive loss. So it's just important to understand why these things happen the way they happen. Anyway, so that's a type 4 tympanoplasty with basically shielding of the carbon minor of the round window, uh, and then the sound pressure from the ear canal is directed here. So you, then you, you get it within 20 dBs, because the middle ear really gives you about 20 dB gain only. So that you can get to within 20 dBs uh, if you can do that perfectly, which we can't. So uh, really there's two kinds of middle ear reconstructions. There's the round window pressure. We, what we try and do with the cycloplasty mostly is round window pressure gain, sorry, over window pressure gain. So all of our cycloplasties nowadays are mostly trying to increase the pressure at the oval window by trying to get a vibrating tympanic membrane, trying to couple that hydraulic lever to the oval window. We don't really care about the ra round window so much, but there's also the type fours and the type fives where you try and just shield the round window and just let the external ear canal pressure drive. We can't get perfect ear bone closure with these, but we try and, um, we try and get achieved that with these kinds of reconstructions.
So, but the trouble is, it's not easy. So we have all these problems we talked about, inefficient driving because you get scarring, you get scarring in the middle edge, your piston falls over, it's inefficient vectors here. Uh, there's lots of things uh, that stop us from getting that kind of system actually working perfectly. And if you're like me, you do a lot of revision surgery, you're dealing with these ears all the time. And, I mean, a lot of what I get is revision surgery, so we're starting off in a very bad spot to start with. So there's really three kind of sites that you have to try and make energy uh, impedance matching. One is ear to the eardrum. So if you're very thick in the eardrum, it's not going to work. Uh, you need to match then the eardrum to the piston. So you have a bad coupling here. That's not going to work. Then you need to match the piston to the foot plate. So if you have bad coupling here, that's not going to work. So there's lots of places where things can break down. And the third thing you have to remember is that it doesn't matter if you have a good coupling if the, if the the vector is a rotation of vector. So if you're not driving the foot plate, just rotating the uh, prosthesis on the foot plate, that's not very efficient. It's not going to drive anything. So a lot of this stuff we talked about is uh, like the silastic banding, uh, the uh, uh, like uh, the uh, artificial malleus, um, the um, Dresden clip. It's to really prevent this rotational vector from happening. So it takes that translational vector and makes sure it, dri it drives the area. So those things are important. In the real world, uh, clinical applications, there's lots of these. Uh, there's the mechanical properties, uh, and, but there's these things that really dominate the results. So with these kinds of ears, this is what dominates these things. In, th in this kind of normal ear, sometimes the mechanical properties are the dominant factors. So most of the time, uh, in, in a we, f we deal with these, these issues being uh, more important often. So uh, by compatibilities, uh, prosthesis selection issues now is partly solved. Uh, stability is key. So <coughs> most times, we're going to sacrifice milling mechanics sometimes for stability because stability is what's going to give you 60 dB hearing loss. If you get the optimal milling mechanics, you might gain 5 or 10 dBs. Stability is really key. So uh, on both sides, scarring is unpredictable. I don't think anybody understands middle ventilation mystery to everybody, uh, and uh, lots of things can go wrong. So you can get fa failure of the eardrum. We talked about that. You get failure of transmission. Uh, wrong vector, you can fail it, we can get distortion. We don't tend to get distortion, middle ear is pretty linear, we measure that. So don't tend to get distortion in the middle ear, but you do get distortion if you put an active device in, like a vibrant sometimes and things like that. So uh, what can go wrong? As I say, if you lose the middle ear, we could try and do a type four and get 20 dB. Uh, I'm gonna skip all this, these things. So th that's the thing, like, okay, so often we try to get this middle ear impedance matching, we're trying to drive, um, when we try and do type 4, for instance, uh, we think, well, why not just put a prosthesis on there? If we get a gain, we get a gain. Um, and if we don't, we just get a type 4. But you don't get a type 4 because you put a piston on there and you've covered it with scar tissue. So now the external ear canal pressure is not driving the oval window anymore. It's basically being attenuated by a big chunk of scar tissue here. So doing a sickle pass can make things worse if you get a much of scar tissue at the uh, oval window. And, and you can... Um, so, so I'm going to talk about some of these things about uh, tympanic membrane, some of the research we've done in our middle ear lab, uh, and, uh, and uh, we'll just see where we get to. So tympanic membrane function stability. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the tympanic membrane things go wrong. So why do we get a hearing loss with tympanic membrane perforation? Which material should we replace tympanic membrane with? Okay, so if you have an eardrum, if you, lost six, if you lost half the eardrum, you should lose 6 dBs, right, in a hydraulic lever. Half the eardrum should lose 6 dBs. But we lose a lot more than 6 dBs. We lose about 20, 25 dBs. Why is that? Because, um, because uh, a lot of the eardrums function decoupled from the oscillators at high frequencies. So basically, you don't, uh, it doesn't matter if you lose half because most of it wasn't coupled anyway at high frequencies. But the main reason we lose, we lose uh, hearing at low frequencies is because we... Generate uh, so if this is normally what happens. The eardrum, there's a pressure differential between the pressure in the ear canal. This is the mastoid middle ear. It vibrates the eardrum. But if you have a hole in there, the pressure is applied to both sides of the eardrum, and there's no pressure differential. So most of a loss at low frequencies because you lose the pressure differential through the. Mem you can you can fix this with cream. I do it all the time in the clinic. Put a bit of cream across the small perforation. The hearing comes back, and then you can uh, give them some idea of, of what they can hear like. So that's just a restoring the baffle. So it doesn't have to be anything particularly fancy uh, at low frequencies. If you have a small mastoid, 
then the pressure generated differential is even less because it's uh, over a smaller surface area. So a, s a small mastoid with a perforation gives you bigger conductive loss than a large mastoid. So for the same size perforation, that's been shown uh, by, by a couple of different people. So does it matter what you replace the eardrum with? So, uh, so it's, uh, for a small size perforation, uh, three or four millimeters, uh, I think it's up to five millimeters, uh, it makes no difference. You should destroy in the baffle. This is some experiments we did in temporal bones. Doesn't matter what you replace that small perforation with, uh, you end up with the same result because you just have to restore that, that baffle effect. Okay, so for under five, uh, I think we went up to five millimeters, uh, it made no difference at all. For a larger perforation, something actually we're just doing this year, and Inga is involved with this, Mustafa, Mustafa Salem in our lab is, uh, this is actually turning out to be quite difficult work. Uh, what about for larger perforations? We know that perichondrium is more flexible than, uh, uh, than cartilage, for instance. So we looked at three different, uh, we're looking at three different uh, uh, um, types of perforation we're repairing. So this is a subtotal. So this leaves some normal hinge area around the edge and around the malleus. And then we're, we're looking at some where we leave a little uh, normal TM around the malleus, and some where we remove everything. We've looked at uh, perforations. This is a perforation. This is a subtotal perforation. So you can see what we did. Uh, replace the perichondrium, thin cartilage, thick cartilage pieces. Uh, we had to use different, we had to use pieces. We put lotidum cream between them to seal any gaps between them. So essentially what we're finding, this is five bones, so it's still going on. Forget anything past 6K, this is just noise floor. Just look up to here. This is the normal tympanic membrane stapes velocity. Uh, and basically, we can get in the low frequency, it doesn't matter what we use, we, we, for a subtotal perforation, when we leave both rims, we can get close to the normal tympanic membrane, five or 10 dBs of it, no matter what we use. This is cream, so cream isn't as good, but whether you stick cartilage, whatever, at high frequencies, they all go to, they all, they all crap up. Nothing, nothing at a high frequency is as good as a tympanic membrane. Uh, and uh, this may be partly mass, it may be partly because there's some very special vibration properties of the tympanic membrane, I'm not sure yet. Uh, but when we do a subtotal perforation, we don't, when we take that rim out, we lose the low frequencies too. For some reason, that hinge, I haven't quite figured this out yet, because we're just getting the results in now, uh, just on four bones of this, we lose the low frequencies and the high frequencies. So that rim seems very important. And uh, with, with the total loss, it's almost as bad as losing the, losing the rim is, is almost as bad as removing, replacing the whole tympanic membrane with something else. Thick cartilage tends to do a little bit worse than perichondrium, I should say. Uh, not a huge difference with them. So. Uh, the other thing we did was we actually laid this on top of the intact tympanic membrane, so we left two rims. Uh, we left the annular uh, rim and we left the malleus rim. So when you load the tympanic membrane in different ways, so this time we know that the underlying this is tympanic membrane, we find the same kind of effect basically. That at, at when we leave, when we take away the, um, when there's no rims and, and, uh, and there's only an umbo rim, these two, you lose the low frequencies and high frequencies. But if you leave that annulus rim, you tend to keep the low frequencies. So that annulus rim seems important for something. Anyway, uh, but clinically, we see not, not much difference between fascia and cartilage. Uh, and, and there's lots of reasons why that might be the case. Let's look at the uh, intrinsic uh, prosthesis that stuff we've done. Uh, basically, does it matter what you, what you reconnect the uh, stapes to the eardrum with? Uh, the truth is, it doesn't really matter as long as it's rigid enough. So we tried all different materials in there. If it's rigid, it's within two, three dBs. So if it's sculpted in because pork wood, if it's soft, it doesn't work. And that makes sense, right? You're just trying to, have the, you're just trying to transmit the uh, vibration low frequency to something rigid that doesn't have a compliance in it. So it doesn't matter, titanium, hydro, they're all working the same, provided they're rigid enough, then it becomes the coupling at the end that's very important. It's not the material it's made of and the biocompatibility. Prosthesis head size doesn't make any difference beyond a certain point. There's three different prosthesis head size all the same in temporal bones that we did. Uh, we looked at, um, we looked at, uh, uh, so this is the problem though, if you, if you make your prosthesis head size too small, you end up maybe sampling a node uh, at higher frequencies. Uh, so it has to be above a certain size. Prosthesis mass, uh, does it matter how heavy the prosthesis is? We start off with a fairly heavy prosthesis, uh, but we added different masses to it. As you might expect, the low, low frequencies of um, uh, stiffness stomach doesn't make any difference. Uh, the higher frequency, you start to lose, drop a little bit. There's only about five, six dB drop here, but you do drop at the high frequency a little bit with the, lar with the heavier prosthesis. And the real world, uh, anything rigid enough wor uh, works, but it's a coupling at the ends that make that difference, whether you end up rotational vector or not. Use the lightest prosthesis available, but not so light, difficult to handle. 
head size. It doesn't have to be big, so why make it big and unless you want to support a big uh, cartilage or something for attraction? So placement choices, uh, uh, I'm gonna just talk about this a little bit. So does it matter if you go to the foot plate or the, or the uh, so does it matter if you do torp or a porp in this kind of setting? The same vector, because it's straight upright. Uh, it turns out not very much. Uh, so whether you go to the foot plate or go to the head of the stapes within three, four dBs, there's not much difference. Um, that's difference. Uh, uh, so when you go in the same vector anyway, it makes not much difference whether you use a, uh, a torp or a porp. Uh, does it matter if you glue that joint? And Thomas was talking about this yesterday, uh, the uh, uh, automimics. So we cemented that joint actually, uh, the auto, the, um, and we looked at the difference in the stapes vibrations when you cement that joint in normal tympanic membranes. Very little difference, in fact. Um, so, uh, so go. So whatever, go whatever, whatever you can make most stab stable. Uh, usually, it will be a it will be a, a torp or a uh, porp in good ears, but it, you can go to a foot plate in bad ears too. And, um, it's almost the same. How should we? How, how much tension should we place it under? What should we cover it with? Does it? Should we go to the malleus tympanic membrane? A lot of this is going to be stability. So go with whatever makes it most stable, because that's going to be more important in the end uh, than anything else. Uh, so optimal tension. How tightly should you place it? There's some work we did some while ago, and basically this is. Uh, we did this, and it's been done since. Since then, it's been reproduced by two other labs. So I know this probably does work. Um, if you put it in tight, you lose low frequencies because you, you really stiffen the eardrum uh, and you stiffen the foot plate. We know stiffness dominates low frequencies. It doesn't like stiffness, so you lose about 10 dBs when you go from a loose prosthesis to a tight prosthesis. Uh, and so you lose low frequencies when you make it too tight, and that, that's true. Um, but it might make it more stable. So you know, if you want to, I know that when, it, when you put a prosthesis or put a fashion, it, it tends to heal in a straight line, so it might lift off. So you want to make sure it doesn't lift off, then you get a 60 dB loss. So you might want to put it in tight. Uh, tension might be needed for stability, though. I'm going to skip that. Um, so what we basically found in this one was that going to the malleus was a little bit better than going to the tympanic membrane. But that could have been because we were going tighter to the tympanic membrane than to the malleus. Anyway, um, just touching the malleus, there's no magic in just touching the malleus. It makes it more stable. When you go from prosthesis, not touching the malleus, touching the malleus, not much difference. Uh, but if we went underneath the malleus, we got a better result because um, I think, um, uh, I, I'm not sure what the reason for that was. I'm not convinced there's anything magic to the malleus. I think it adds stability. Anyway, uh, in the real world, uh, we don't want to go too far anterior because you end up with this uh, rotational vector here. So if your malleus is here and stapes is here, instead of driving this up and down, uh, you end up with a rotational vector here. Unless you can constrain this with like a clip or something or with stylistic bending, this will just rock on here. So uh, what about the head of the prosthesis? If you can put something on top of it, like cartilage, should it be thick or thin? Um, in fact, uh, uh, does size make a difference with the cartilage? Um, yes, and the thicker the cartilage we found, the worse the results in the low frequencies. That's a tension effect. Because when you put thick cartilage, large pieces, you really tense the eardrum. Uh, you pay a price for that. We know that in the low frequencies, thick uh, tension is bad. Uh, but you use it anyway because you stabilize the tympanic membrane, stops extrusion. Uh, so, uh, so, if you need, uh, uh, so often in large pieces to prevent retractions, you need to cover and prevent retraction and reconstruct sputum anyway. So thickness of cartilage in that, in that interface between the prosthesis and the eardrum, we tried three different thicknesses of cartilage between the prosthesis and the eardrum. There was no difference, but that wasn't replacing the whole tympanic membrane. That was just the thickness of a cartilage between the normal tympanic membrane and the prosthesis. So, uh, does it, so does it matter how, how rigid whatever you cover th the prosthesis with is? So we looked at three different types of rigidity. We put glass, uh, marrow cell, and cartilage. And in fact, as you might expect, the, the marrow cell soaks up high frequencies, got a lot of compliance, uh, but the cartilage and glass were pretty similar. So cartilage is pretty good. Uh, and I'm going to skip that. Recommendations. Uh, so basically, you could, it doesn't make too much difference. What material covers them? Not too mush mushy. Uh, effective scarring. This is a big effect. So we try to simulate scarring at the posterior end by putting stereo strip from the back of the eardrum to the timp uh, to the uh, uh, eardrum, <coughs> the ear canal, I should say. And uh, forget about this. Is this is uh, at the low frequency? We had a lot of noise. Uh, we uh, we see an effect uh, of 10 to 15 dBs here. Quite a big effect from that kind of scarring. 
uh, when we put prosthesis, when we, when we simulate adhesions, prosthesis to the annulus with superglue, we see again see a 10 to 15 dB effect. Uh, when we tr when we uh, so I think scarring is a very big issue. Uh, uh, so and then the other thing you have to think about is no matter what kind of mode of vibration you're looking at, um, whether you're looking at this kind of mode of vibration, this kind or this kind, the edges move the least. So you try and move away from the edges of the eardrum if you can. So I think one of the advantages of going from a uh, going from a torp uh, to a torp, oops. Uh, is that often your torp ends up bent a little bit anteriorly, away from the scarred edges of the eardrum. And I always try and bend my prosthesis a little bit more towards the center for that reason. Uh, uh, fixation to the, uh, we try to cement. This is a slow acting cement that sets over eight minutes and we cemented the prosthesis to the promontory. Over eight minutes, it gets more and more heavily cemented. And so as you can see, as, as it gets adhered more and more uh, over eight minutes, the vibration function of the stapes goes down and down and down. This is minus 25 dBs by the time it's fully cemented. So uh, prosthesis adhesions to the facial nerve promontory have a big effect. Stability, uh, as soon as you finish the cycloplasty, your body goes to work. So you might think you're gonna get something in the operation, it's not when you end up with six months or a year later. Stabilization is key. I'm not gonna talk about this too much. There's lots of ways to stabilize the lateral end. New amalias, uh, 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 the uh, Malice relocation, uh, the prosthesis that Robert showed yesterday. Um, and we talked about this before. If, so the medial end stabilization and preventing that rotation vector, clips, banding, foot plate shoes, none of these are fantastic. On the f uh, this is pretty good. Um, Thalassic band is pretty good. But if you don't have a superstructure, there's no easy way to really stabilize the medial end on the foot plate. That's, that's a challenge with torque. That's what we're facing with. Uh, and I've tried fat and, and you know, I'm I use fat quite a bit to stabilize the middle end. Ventilation is key. We spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to talk about it. Um, I've done this. Uh, this is all. This is just all um, hearing results. So clinically, we can't tell because our resolution is so gross. Uh, there's so many factors. Uh, the scarring in different areas are so different that we really need the temporal bone models to give us some insights into the mechanisms and why we think we're getting what we're getting. And. Uh, we don't, we usually only report up to 3K, we should be reporting up to 8K. There's a coarse frequency resolution, we only go octave steps on the audiogram instead of, you know, s uh, finer frequencies. We don't separate type one from other tympanoplasties when you get reporting. We need huge numbers to show difference. Uh, so, um, so, and these factors work in combination, uh, not just uh, one at a time. So in our labs, we're building this, uh, these are, this is a 64 element pro, we're building it up, we've just built in our labs actually. Uh, in uh, Dalhousie, and uh, we hope to be able to get this kind of, this is, this is that probe looking in the ear, through the eardrum. You can see the eardrum, you can see the head of the stapes, handle the malleus. We wanted to get ethics approval, start using this in humans. Uh, might be able to answer some of these questions. And this is actually the cadaver, but you can see the kind of resolution we're getting with the si it's a 60 megahertz probe. Uh, we started building some OCT technologies. Uh, this is from Dan McDougall with James Rainsbury, who is one of my ex-fellows. And this is uh, our first OCT that we built in our own lab. If you look at the eardrum, this is cadaveric eardrum. We, ca we can see through the eardrum now. We can see the prosthesis. We can see the tibia. We can see the malleus. We can see the handle of the malleus. Uh, and we're starting to get this kind of resolution now. Now we can actually do Doppler with this too. So I hope to take this to the clinic. Um, and we just got ethics approval using the patients. Uh, so anyway, uh, in a nutshell, any rigid biocompatible prosthesis works. Choose prosthesis for handling, visibility, and stability. Uh, these are keys in the kinds of ears I deal with. Uh, staging, clip, stabilized, systemic procarlic symptomoplasty. Uh, think about ventilation and sniffers. Um, we talked about that yesterday. And no one has the answer to predictable results in severely damaged ears. So if you start off with a ventilated ear, yes, we can start to work with those. If you have a severely damaged ear with lack of ventilation, scarring, nobody has a good answer to that. And the key is often uh, avoiding scarring and providing some way to ventilate. Get it. it's again, to get impedance matching, you have to have a vibrating eardrum. How do you get that? If you can solve that, we can start to uh, solve some of the problems. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Right, okay. I don't know. We quick questions. Yeah, uh, Robert's got one. No, 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 no. just to ask me. All right, he hasn't got a question. Right, okay. <laughs>
<laughs> mesmerised. Anybody got a quick question before we go for coffee? Come on, two questions. Okay. Am I not talking now? No, you're on. Okay. No, no, we're having to well, I coffee break now? You don't ask my price. Nice to no, no, no. What, what do you want to do? Right, okay. The question's first. Okay, right. Okay. My question is, if there is any traumatic purpose... I'm, I'm Mehul from India, Ahmedabad. My question is, uh, what is the difference between traumatic perforation and uh, the same size of CSOM perforation? The mechanics, how, how does it change? And how the, uh, how the deafness is that? So the difference between a, a uh, traumatic, fresh traumatic perforation and, and, the, and the CO, CO. Yeah. So same without, so, yeah. no, no osicular chain, uh, any... Uh, they're exactly the same mechanically. So uh, the trouble with COSM is usually they have other problems. Though. They have scarring, they have temporal sclerotic plaque, they have fixation of the uh, ossicles in some way. But if the ossicles are the same, the only thing that makes a difference is the size of the perforation. So location has... I will say, yeah. even though the, the, the patient is not complex, yeah. so much complex than the complex than the case is the same. So all the things are normal. Yeah. Well, the mechanically, they're the same. They have the same hearing loss. So they, don't, and they, they might have a difference in perception with an acute onset of hearing loss versus chronic onset of hearing loss. But that's a perceptual issue. From the mechanics point of view, it's the same effect on the vibrations. I mean, you can make, you know, because if the ossicles are the same, but that's not usually the case. In COSM, the ossicles are not usually the same. They're usually stiffer. I don't know how you can have the ossicles the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dipan from the UK. Manahar, from what you said, um, are you suggesting that a carbon miner is uh, a better long-term solution than uh, if you've got absent um, stapes superstructure and absent malleus? Um, than putting a torp in which could potentially be unstable? Um, yeah, it could be. I mean, I, I don't do a lot of them. Um, that's because we have things like Baja and middle-air drivers and things like that we can fall back on. Um, but, um, um, but it can be... The trouble with the carbon miner is getting... Uh, it sounds easy, but it's very hard to get a thin, uh, thin skin graft on the stapes footplate that will stay thin. So... You, so that's the hard part of the cup. And then the second part is you still got to ventilate the middle ear. You have to ventilate the RAM window. So you still have to have a RAM window that, uh, that's connected to your station that works. So those two things make that not such an easy prospect. But people have reported very good results from carbon miners. Yeah. 